Well, the courthouse clock says it's six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and call this April meeting of the Blunt County Board of Zoning Appeals to order. Roger, if you call the roll, please. Andy Allen. Here. Larry Chesney. Here. Bruce Damro. Stan Hedrick. Here. Rob Walker. Here. If there's no discussion, is there a motion to approve last month's meeting minutes? All in favor say aye. Tonight we have two special exceptions and one variance. I'll uh, start with the special exceptions, but I'd like to ask you guys to use your microphones on behalf of Karen, who prepares the minutes for us, so it helps her out quite a bit. Uh, the first special exception is at 4402 <coughs> Terrace View Road. This request is for a change of use at that address. The property is identified on tax map 17D, group B, parcel 26, and is zoned suburbanizing. The property was previously used by a biological laboratory. I think they did medical lab work. And the proposed use will be as a warehouse and offices for a gun magazine distributor. Uh, not a publication magazine, but a holds rounds magazine. There will be no retail sales and the business will have six employees. Other than daily UPS uh, pickup and delivery, there will be one larger delivery truck a week, approximately. Currently there is a no truck sign at the beginning of the Mimosa Drive. I, I'd spoke with Bill at the highway uh, department, but he has, once he did a site visit, he revised some things and that's the memo that I sent to you guys uh, from his department. Uh, and then below, you know, I, I included the section 5.4, which gives the BZA the authority to change a non-conforming use. Uh, based on the, the prospective use being less impact on the, the area. And then I did provide you with an aerial view of the property in question. Is there anyone here in favor of this special exception would like to speak? Could you come to the microphone in the front, please, so we can hear you? Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. I work for the company that's uh, proposed the uh, motion in front of you. Um, as the gentleman said, we're, uh, we're actually a manufacturer of the magazine, so we're operated basically a just, uh, just in time inventory type situation to where 80% of our product is sold before it's even arrived at our facility. Uh, we have six employees. Uh, we have a UPS drop off uh, daily and a UPS pickup daily. Other than that, there'd probably be an occasional truck. Uh, come into the facility and leave. Uh, and then that's basically it. That's, that's the reason that we, that we asked for this. Uh, other than that, I'd be glad to answer any questions or concerns. For the record, have. Kevin, can you tell us your last name? Sure, it's Phillips. Phillips? Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, you, you manufacture gun parts? Uh, just magazines and accessories the clips. Uh, for, for firearms. Yes. What what kind do they fit? Uh, shotguns, uh, mostly like um, in Tennessee, it's uh, you can only like turkey hunt with a shotgun with a uh, with three rounds. So mm -hmm. we manufacture a, a two round magazine uh, that gives all of our Tennessee hunters the capability of, of legally hunting turkey with a uh, magazine fed shotgun. Do you own the building now, or you just have an option on it? We do. We own a, a building that we're at currently. Uh, for for this location here? Uh, no, we have a, uh, for this location, we have uh, uh, an offer that's been accepted, um, hoping that we can get uh, where, this where exception. Are you, where are you located now? Uh, off uh, Broadway, Broadway Avenue. Are you wanting to move this for a bigger location? Or it's a bigger location. Um, obviously, uh, it's laid out a little bit better. We're growing a little bit right now. And um, it's just, just a nicer location uh, for us and, and for the employees. 
if we don't have any more questions right now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is there anyone in opposition who would like to speak? Uh, yes, sir. I am uh, Steve Daves. I am president of the Mimosa States Homeowner Association and also a resident of Mimosa States, of course, and there are several other members of the uh, board of the Mimosa States Homeowner Association present. And we oppose this exception. Uh, the board, there's a nine member board of the Homeowner Association and we have considered this and unanimously voted to oppose the exception and I have submitted a memorandum that, that sets forth uh, my thoughts and uh, my impressions and what I think are the facts uh, related to this matter as I read the Blount County Board, Board of Zoning Appeals resolution that was passed subsequent to when this building was built. A little, little bit of history, and I'll try not to take up too much time, but this building, I uh, believe, was built in 1980. It was originally a, um, a building that housed a, a movie or a film production company, a company that produced uh, old commercials, uh, small films of that type. And then subsequently, after a few years, it was sold to this uh, research laboratory that has operated out of the of the building ever since. It's located on a parcel that is immediately adjacent to Mimosa Estates and um, I think I have submitted with my affidavit an aerial photograph and you all have an aerial photograph that if, you, if I can kind of uh, go over this with you but as we see Mimosa Estates is a subdivision of about 185 houses just off of Alcoa Highway entered through Sing Singleton Station Road and then where this building would be located is at the I guess the uh, southeast uh, corner of the subdivision and this is the building in question right here. This is the entrance to the subdivision here and to get to this building uh, vehicles have to come in this, the main entrance of the subdivision, travel on and along Mimosa Drive make a left turn on the Terrace View Drive, and then the access to the building is off of Terrace View. And both Mimosa Drive and Terrace View are subdivision streets. Um, there's a, an apartment, a series of apartments right here at this section of the subdivision, and then, of course, residential houses immediately across the street from this building, and then the main part of the subdivision continues on um, northwest of where we're talking about here. There was mention in uh, the building commissioner's report about a no truck sign. Well, the no truck sign is positioned right here at the entrance, uh, just after the entrance to the subdivision. And that no truck sign has been there for several years, and so, which is uh, currently the status. The businesses that have operated there through the years the production company and more recently the biological research lab as I stated in in the memorandum have been I, I would use the term quiet low impact businesses uh, no truck traffic associated with either one of those businesses through the years this this building was built before the zoning regulation was established the other there are other commercial buildings that are sort of in that uh, quadrant uh, where this building is located, but all of the other buildings have access off of Singleton Station Road. And this is the only building in that quadrant that has access off of a neighborhood street. And I think that is uh, extremely important in consideration of this exception. The building now, in relation to the uh, zoning regulations, is a non-conforming use. This is a, this section has been designated as a suburbanizing district. 
And of course, going to the regulations, there are specific uh, building requirements for a suburbanizing district. And this building, if it was built uh, or proposed to be built today, would not uh, uh, qualify as a use within a suburbanizing district. So we're talking about a non-conforming use and the conforming, which is grandfathered in, uh, in relation to the um, zoning regulations. And we're talking now, as you know, it's a change from a non-conforming use and which requires this uh, special exception. And the authority of the board, as I understand the regulations, to approve a change in business, and this definitely is a change in business from a biological lab to a warehouse and distribution center for gun parts. We're definitely talking about a, a change in the business. There'd be no dispute about that. Well, that brings into play, as, uh, as the building commissioner has said, section 5.4 and the authority of the board to grant a, a, a special exception here comes uh, from the, sec the sentence that says that the authority arises if the board finds that such use is of lesser impact than the original non-conforming use. So whether you go back to the movie production business or to the biological lab business, you've got to compare the impact of this business with the impact of previous businesses. And I submit that on its face, this application fails to show lesser impact. And I would submit that on its face, this uh, application shows uh, greater impact. Um, just from the proposal and from the report of the building commissioner and the comments, or I believe of Mr. Phillips, this building and this business is going to create truck traffic that was never uh, present before. And in particular, the report of the building commissioner talks about a larger, one larger truck a week at the outset, and that larger truck delivery, as I understand it, would be a tractor trailer truck. At least that's uh, based on my conversation with the commissioner. Um, impact is further shown by the fact that to permit the type truck traffic that would ha have to approach this business, the safety sign the no truck sign that's at the intersection of Mimosa States is going to have to be moved. At least that was the proposal uh, in the commissioner's report. It's going to have to be moved so as to allow, the, I think the proposal is to move it west past the intersection with Terrace View so that now trucks could come up and turn left on Terrace View and come to the business without violating uh, that sign. So on his face, there's the impact that, without going further, is a greater impact, uh, not lesser impact. And I don't say that criticizing this business for what uh, they're undertaking to do. That's fine, but this is just not the place for it. Uh, so. Going further, as I pointed out, uh, to um, Section 5.4, references Section 11.5 of the regulations. You go to 11.5. Um, again, it talks about for the board to approve and permit a special exception. The special exception is um, going down to number three, that, uh, it, that we have authority under these regulations and that the proposed special exception, if constructed or established, uh, will not comply with one or more requirements of this resolution. If, if, that's, if the board makes that finding, then the special exception should not be granted. So then you go to section nine, the suburbanizing district, and you go to the special exception that can be granted in a suburbanizing district under section C. Section C says, Uses permitted as special exceptions with specific limitations. Any commercial activity not specifically identified in A or B above and which is allowed as a permitted use in a commercial district provided that any such use shall be located only with access and frontage on an arterial or collector status road. 
as specified in the major road plan of any regional planning commission and so forth. Well, obviously, Terrace View, which is the access and the only access for this building, is not an arterial or collector status road. It's just simply a subdivision street. So subsection C would restrict approval of a special exception in this case. Suburbanizing districts uh, uh, talk about, and I won't read all these, uh, uh, talk about uh, single lot duplex dwellings, customary home occupations, group homes, churches, temples, place, other places of worship, uh, local, state, and federal government utility uses, these type things would qualify at the outset if we're talking about a new building for a suburbanizing district. But for there to be a special exception, if you go no further, the type road we have here would exclude a special exception in this case. And then if you get down to the fine print of the application in this case and compare it with, again with subsection C, it talks about uh, for special, special exception, the lot must be one acre. The application here shows this lot is 0.95 acres. Uh, the footprint of the structure no greater than 4,000 square feet. The application here shows the building uh, has a footprint greater than 4,000 square feet. I think it's 4,750 feet. So, the basic, and as I understand, and I talked with Bill Dunlap uh, yesterday, and Mr. Dunlap, uh, I asked him about this uh, moving of the sign situation, which I said we would uh, respectfully oppose that, and he said that he had, when he had received my phone call and a voicemail message in between that and me talking to him, he'd made the site visit and then I spoke with him and he said, well, I have, uh, didn't really understand the situation out there. And he said, I agree that truck traffic would be inappropriate. I haven't seen what, uh, and he said he was doing a memo as we were speaking. I haven't seen the memo, but I understand that's what's being circulated. So with that said, and I've got other photographs uh, that I've submitted with my affidavit showing pictures of the neighborhood, pictures of the entrance uh, to the subdivision, pictures of the streets, and just to show the nature of the, of the, of the area. The entrance to Mimosa Estates, the main entrance where this uh, would be accessed, is um, sort of an unusual triangular entrance, um, trees at the corner. There's already been concern of the members of the neighborhood with ordinary vehicle traffic uh, turning left into that uh, entrance as being a hazard for vehicles ex exiting the neighborhood. It's definitely not built for tractor trailer, tractor trailer truck traffic, uh, marginal for UPS type truck traffic. And even a high volume of that type truck traffic uh, would be less than desirable and would be an impact. And certainly tractor trailer truck traffic is not, is not appropriate. We're talking about at the outset a regular uh, visit of once a week by a tractor trailer truck, where that goes from there, uh, who knows, but certainly the door would be, would be open uh, even for more traffic. If this exception was granted for this type warehouse, then down the road, uh, we don't know what we'd be facing from another applicant uh, if the business sold for approval of some other warehouse type property. Uh, the precedent would be set and we would be uh, in, a, in a pickle in that regard. So I think on its face uh, this application uh, fails and we respectfully request that the uh, board uh, deny this uh, request for special exception. Uh, there are other members of the uh, board here. If they uh, wanted to speak, I think uh, y'all certainly be glad to hear them. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that y'all have. We might have some in a minute. We'll just try to let some other folks speak if they feel okay. like it. 
And I'd like to enter into minutes. There is a letter that the uh, resident who lives right at the intersection, the first house, uh, as you enter, uh, and I think uh, this uh, request this be entered in the minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you. All. Is there anyone else in opposition of this special exception who would like to speak? <clears throat> Hearing none, we'll open up the floor for discussion from the board. Is that the letter? <clears throat> Is it 4441? The letter, is it the house that's there? The letter is from the 1441. 1410 Mimosa Drive. 1410 Mimosa Drive. Mr. Phelps, is there anything you'd like to add? Yes. The one thing I wanted to add was about the impact. Um, the previous business that was in there employed 16 people, had eight to 10 deliveries a day, and did have semis come in and out of there with no conflict whatsoever, uh, and no complaints from the Homeowners Association. Uh, I, I think he failed to mention that. Uh, and I just wanted to say, we have six to seven employees. We have UPS twice a day, one for drop off, one, one for pickup. The deliveries that, that, that the previous business was getting was not just single axle trucks. They were dual and, and, and tri-axle trucks with semis. Uh, so I just wanted to state the facts uh, that the uh, gentleman prior left out, that the previous business there had a lot more traffic than, than, than we anticipated on having. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Any other discussion from the board? I'm Nadine Wright, and I'm on the board, and I also live Caddy Corner to this business. And I would like to see his statistics of how many tractor trailer trucks came in when it was a lab because to my knowledge, and I'm home 24 seven, we did not have tractor trailer trucks. Now UPS would stop once in occasion, but we had no problems with either one of the others. So I don't know where that information is coming from, but I know cause I live there. I live at the corner of Terrace View and Crestwood. That's all. I got a question. What you live in, what number? Nadine Wright. No, what number? What number? My 1314 Crestwood. Come up to the end of Terrace View and it runs into Crestwood. And I'm the first house. Number, street number again? Pardon? Street number? 1314 Crestwood. That's where she is. She's right here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, sir. My name is David Taylor. Uh, my wife and I have lived in my most estates since 1967, so we're more or less senior members of the subdivision. Uh, anytime there's a tractor trailer comes in either one of the entrances to my most estates, like a moving van or anything, bringing people in or out. They have trouble getting turned around and getting out. This, this entrance they're talking about is the main entrance to the subdivision. I live at 1448 Hillville Road, which is on the other side of the subdivision, what they call the old part. But any time a tractor trailer came in through the entrance and had to make a left turn to get into this building, it's going to screw up traffic and probably get in some of the people's yards there. If they try to back in to this place, it's going to be hard. We don't, we don't need any tractor trailer vehicles in this subdivision period. My wife's been director. Some of the other directors are here. We've talked to people. People are not in favor of this. The board needs to consider this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name 
name's Ernest Fuson, F-U-S-O-N. <clears throat> I owned the building and had the business before. Uh, we had 16 employees. We had two of the large UPS trucks today. We did not routinely have semis, but we did on occasion have to have semis come in to deliver equipment, pick up equipment. Uh, and um, I hope we didn't disturb anybody. If we did, I apologize for that now. But to the best of my knowledge, it was never a problem. The only problem I know that I caused anybody was the um, occasionally the bird alarm would go off and there was no problem. And so it made a noise that I could brush over there and get it turned off. But uh, other than that, I don't think we caused any grief. I can't speak to the tractor trailer, That's, uh, uh, but I, I, I believe it will be fine. But of course, I, that's, I have a dog in that fight, so I would say that. Thank you. Thank you. No one else would like yeah. to speak. The chair will entertain a motion. Well, I got a question. If uh, if there was no tractor trailers going into this business, would you still object to the business being there? If there was, if there was no uh, I think that's the main consideration here. As I understand it, that's part and parcel of this application. Because UPS trucks are in the subdivision every day, so that's sort of negated. It's just a tractor and trailer. Well, you raise a good point. Is uh, I think UPS trucks are in any subdivision frequently. Here we're talking about now creating a steady flow of UPS trucks. But that aside, uh, I, as I understand it, the tractor trailer truck issue is uh, is a major. Is a major issue that that's uh, that's a part of this proposal is uh, such that going to require or required a proposed movement of of the no truck sign. Uh, so at this so point in time, no. The so you would you would object to the business this business being there, period, right? I object. I think a warehouse business is a distinct change in and of itself and raises an impact issue itself. But I would agree the major issue is the tractor trailer truck traffic and the frequent UPS truck traffic. Well, And I think that uh, Mr. Fusion has uh, confirmed that uh, this would be a, be a significant change. Complimenting him and what he said, they've maintained that building as, uh, and I think pictures show that, there's a well-kept front yard uh, shrubbery, it's, it's, it's kept like, it's kept like the front of your house up to now. And I envision that, uh, and again, no criticism about operating a warehouse, but that, uh, it's just not, it, it, it's not likely to be maintained. And then number two, I go back to, to, for there to be authority for a change in a suburbanizing district, and this is definitely a change, you've got to have access on an arterial, arterial roadway. And we don't have that here, whether it's tractor trailer truck traffic or not. This is a commercial business, it's a change in a commercial business, and the, the zoning regulation is specific that this type of access is, is not authorized for a and, and I think candidly that the uh, sub members of the subdivision would uh, not want a warehouse in and of itself, whatever it might house, to be a part of the neighborhood. The, uh, you know, the uh, film business, um, I think going back to the years, was an asset by itself. We, we would have neighborhood meetings in, in that building. Uh, they would op they, it was a, it's a large open room like this one and we would have room for all the neighbors to meet in that building and it was, it was, uh, it, it was an asset. The, the building has operated uh, uh, with the laboratory, sort of, that was sort of a, sort of a high tech uh, building that was well kept and uh, always considered that an asset, always dreaded the day that it would be sold. And this day has come, and this is the kind of thing. Not, again, not to the warehouse is uh, it, it, its business is 
in and of itself acceptable, but it's just not, this isn't the place for it. And the zoning regulations speak to that. Maybe I hope I've answered your question, but then yeah. the traffic is, is, is a big thing. Okay. I got a question of the applicant. Uh, why do you have one tractor trailer a week? Some Seems of the, like you just got one delivery a week. <clears throat> well, some of the product right now that, that we get in, like I said, we're just in time inventory. So uh, when the manufacturing facility delivers or has a large sum of product for us to deliver, the only way for us to get it to our distributors uh, is by semi-truck. So we need that. Uh, occasionally just to deliver. I mean, we need that space. So that's, uh, UPS that's, just can't carry it. That's shipping out instead of getting in? Uh, it's both. It comes in from the facility, and then the same day we turn around and ship it back out. How big of shipments are they? I'm sorry. How, big, how big of a shipments are they? Um, sometimes between, you know, two pallets to 14 to 15 pallets. Um, it, it depends on, on the orders that was placed. Uh, and honestly, not to insult anyone, but I think, you know, the elephant in the room is I, I honestly don't think even if we said we weren't going to have any uh, semis come through, I don't, I think because of the nature of the business that we're in is really what the issue is, is why, is why they're opposed to it. Well, uh, that, that's sort of irrelevant to me. Uh, and I would hope it would be for the homeowners. I mean, we're so low impact that, you know, I even wrote this letter I was going to read to you guys, but to be honest with you, that's, you know, I'm from Cookville, so I, I don't yeah. need to prepare a speech. Well, not. But all of our lawns professionally landscaped. The, you know, we're, going to, we're going to maintain the property uh, to the highest extent. It's not going to be dilapidated. It's not going to be worn out. You're not going to be, see a bunch of junk cars in the parking lot or anything like that. We're going to maintain the building. What's the, uh, what's the possibilities of obtaining access uh, from one of the three other parcels there in front of you, or beside you, right behind you, for instance? We would love to. I mean, a direct route to Singleton Station would be ideal. Have you tried to get access there? We haven't talked, we haven't been able to track down who actually owns the, the right of way to be able to cut through it and what type of zoning issues we'd run into. Um, you know, I, I know there's been a couple of other offers on the building, but honestly, the companies that are going there are going to be such a higher impact for the community. Uh, that are storing chemicals and repairing cars and, and everything else that uh, our opinion was that, you know, the fit for us was, you know, if we can figure out a way to avoid having a semi drive into the, into the neighborhood, we'd love to. Uh, we just need uh, to figure out how to cut the right of way directly through. I think there's like a speed shop or something that's facing the outside of Singleton Station. I'd love to be able to cut a right away right, right to Singleton Station to be able to pull the semi straight in. What about, what about the parcel 4419? I think, I think that's part of the apartment complex that's next door. I mean, honestly, we didn't want to have to do this. We wanted to just be able to buy the building and, and move yeah. in and be a good neighbor and, and have uh, different access to the building and not even have to go through the subdivision. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't track down who has the right-of-way rights to those buildings. Uh, and honestly, we're, we're, you know, we don't have the knowledge of which committees to go in front of to, well, to be yeah. able to get approval. Well, if it was me, I'd first of all see if, I, if the property owners was willing to even talk about it. And if they were, then I'd go from there. But... Uh, That's, that's all I got. Sure. Thanks. Yes, sir. I, I don't know. This gentleman is very good with, he's very smart. I don't know all those regulations like he does. Uh, but we were a commercial enterprise and uh, we paid commercial taxes 40%. And we were on that street. Um, I don't know what you call that kind of street, but that's where we were. And we had the two big UPS trucks a day minimum, sometimes three, uh, 16 employees. And I hope we didn't disturb anybody. I don't think we did, but uh, we tried to keep the place nice and uh, be a good neighbor. And it sounds from his, the tone of this guy that um, 
uh, who I just met tonight, it sounds like they have the same attitude toward the uh, community. We understand that, or I'm sure, he, and he seems also to understand that. So uh, I think he would work hard to be a good neighbor. Yes, sir. Bill Loop. Yeah, with uh, with Nelson Realtors, and I'm representing uh, Dr. Fusion on the sale of the property over and everything like And he mentioned about, did we maybe speak to one of the commercial properties behind us or facing Singleton Station about maybe access? And that may be a possibility. But really, up until this week, uh, we didn't think there'd be a problem. I mean, that is from our discussion with Mr. Dunlap about the sign and and everything we really just didn't think it was going to be a, that was going to be an issue and as far as the the the, the fellow that's wanting to buy it mr capella uh, and i understand everything they're saying completely uh, 100 percent uh, as as far as the appearance of the property and everything like that that's something you'll never have to worry about mr capella went into the old milk uh, building down here on East Broadway, which was just a complete eyesore, and went in there and I mean just fixed the place up and it's a very sharp looking building. He's a first class guy, appearance wise, operation and everything. But as far as the traffic over there, again, we just did not see that as an issue. Um, Dr. Fusion had the same amount of UP UPS trucks daily um, that, that Phil does with the business over here. And he periodically had uh, 18 wheelers that came in and made uh, deliveries and everything. And then like I said, then after our conversation with, uh, with Bill, with uh, Mr. Dunlap, and, and we explained these things to him and, and the area and showed pictures of everything like that, we just didn't, we just didn't think it, that was gonna be, a, I mean, we, we, we understood somebody might not like magazines or something like that, that part there, but that wasn't, that wasn't something that we thought was going to be an issue. And that's, that's all I got to say on it. Thank you. Any more discussion from the board? Not that Chair will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to deny the request. The, uh, since the um, truck sign's already up, I wouldn't want tractor trailers pulling in down my subdivision every day. And that's not the intent. According to the letter from Mr. Dunlap here, that's definitely not the intent of the, the road when it was built. Sensors. I second the motion. Andy Allen. Clarify. Voted yes. Uh, Return. Yeah, the, the motion is to deny the court request based on truck traffic in the highway, the highway department's letter. So voting yes is to deny. So voting yes is to deny the request. Thank yes. you. Yes. Larry Chesney. Yes. Bruce Stamrose not here. Stan Hedrick. Yes. Rob Walker. Yes. Motion was approved. Next item tonight is a request for a AM radio tower on Middle Settlements Road. Give me just a second. Uh, this request is for an AM radio tower to be located at 1525 Middle Settlements Road. The property is identified on tax map 46 parcels parcel uh, 45, and the property is zones S for suburbanizing. The property is approximately 6.8 acres. And below I went through a, a checklist on this one. It's a, it's a little bit different than a, than a cell tower request in the fact that some of the things we require in the application for cell tower just aren't applicable 
uh, for this AM radio tower, but to, like the inventory of existing towers, uh, this would be the applicant's only tower. The visual effects and screening, this tower is a small guy tower that is triangular with 18 inch sides. The support structure will be a small garden shed at the base of that tower, similar to the ones found at the uh, for sale at a local hardware store. I, I, I think I did include a picture of what he's proposing there. The lighting at 195 feet tall, the tower wouldn't require to be lit. And the structural safety standards, uh, we've got Mr. Perry's review as part of the packet. The franchise authorization licenses have is operated through WBCR. That is good through uh, 8-1-2020. Um, public notices were sent out and the property was posted and I had run into paper. The site plan was submitted that indicates the distances from the tower to the property lines and existing residents. The landscaping will be around the ground support structure, which will consist of a privacy fence bordered with uh, a tea olive bushes. The guy wires will extend out 137 feet from the tower and will have uh, security fencing around each point. And the, the tower will be 205 feet from the abutting property lines at its closest points. Uh, Co-location for this tower, uh, would not be used for co-location of uh, cellular phone antennas. Uh, the separation distances is the, the place where there's some consideration. Uh, the separation dis distance will not meet the 300% of the tower height that is required from residentially used properties or residential used lots. They will exceed the 200 feet minimum requirement. The board does have the ability to reduce the separation distance in accordance to section 7.4 D7 of the zoning regulations. And then I, I put the tower regulations in there for you guys to have on hand. Is there anyone here in favor of this special exception that would like to speak? My wife, Frida, and I have operated WBCR for about uh, 18 years. Uh, this will be the uh, first time WBCR will be able to own property. We are leasing now. The lease is up, and uh, you know, we need a new home. Uh, there aren't any... Uh, abandoned or vacant uh, AM radio towers. Uh, the AM radio technology uh, requires a ground system of wires that cannot accommodate a cell tower location. And uh, so, you know, it's impossible techno technically for an AM radio to co-locate with either a cell tower uh, or some other tower unless it has a, a ground system technology. So uh, we ask your indulgence in uh, granting this exception so we can have a six acre lot that we would be able to own and operate an AM tower. Were you unable to renew your lease on your existing tower? Not in favorable uh, manner. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, question. <clears throat> yes, sir. Is this the only tower your radio station has? Yes, sir. You you will have one tower. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But broadcasting is done at another location. The studio is in Eagleton Village, and we use a, a phone line to uh, carry the programming to the transmitter at the tower, which is the same method that we currently use to send the uh, programming to the tower out by Grandview Cemetery. And so this is the lo closest location you can find? Yes, sir. To yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's rather difficult with all of the controls that are placed on, you know, locating a tower today. You have to be 
you know, so far from cell towers and uh, so, far, so far from power lines. And if you have looked at the power line grid in Blount County and the number of cell towers that are here, it's extremely difficult to find a location that would not violate those restrictions. And we've been looking for a number of years, and uh, so it's to, to make this uh, move possible. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else in favor of this special exception who'd like to speak? Carrie said, we've been paying rent for 18 years. Could you tell us your name, please, for the record? My name is Frida Grothjohn. We've been paying uh, rent on this tower for 18 years, and uh, probably, what, three times? They've gone up on the rent, and uh, we can expect it to go up again. So this would be very good for us to have our own tower. Uh, we can take that same money and by the tower and own it ourselves. Thank you. Anyone else in favor? <clears throat> There's only one opposition that like to speak. Hearing none, we'll open the floor up for discussion from the board. Roger, you received no objections from any of the neighbors. I had uh, I only had one one phone call, uh, and it. They seem to not be favorable of it as far as looking at the at a tower. Um, I'm not. I, I tried to, to the best of my ability, tried to explain. You know what type of tower? It's a, it's, it looks more like a ham radio tower than anything, but just taller. But that, that's the only phone call I received on it. It has a note in here, just for interest, that the uh, antenna or the guy wires would be buried underground or something. I've seen in there. What? Well, yeah. Mr. Uh, Perry may be able to answer that since he's the, the engineer. Yes. I, I thought that it would be necessary to install radio ground system <clears throat> copper wire with copper wife that extends out to the base of the tower. 200 feet and every three degrees, and will be buried under the ground. Now, let me let me explain that. <clears throat> My name is Larry Perry, and we're a consultant to you, the Board of Zoning Appeal. In a broadcast station, uh, ADM broadcast station, you have a vertical tower, okay? That goes up, in this case, 195 feet. But in order to have a ground system, because in ADM, AM unlike FM, the radio waves travel along the face of the earth. The ideal place is to put it in a swamp somewhere because you get in the groundwater. So you want it low, you don't want it high. Now, in order to compensate for that, the Federal Communication Commission requires each station to put in 120 radials out from the base of the tower every three degrees uh, in order to, and that's copper wire, generally it's number 12 copper wire bare, and it's buried about six inches under the ground. That's what, we're, that's what I was referring to there. Maybe I just didn't get a good thing, but you don't see that it's buried because if, if it was above the ground, hell, it wouldn't be there for 15 minutes before somebody would steal the doggone stuff. So you, we bury, they bury it under the ground about seven inches. They plow it in. So you got your, your guy wires coming down in every three degrees. No, 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 no. You have, you have only three guy wires. You got, you got a tower here yeah. and you got three guy wires at 120 degrees apiece. Then underneath that tower, Underneath the tower, right. you've got wires that run in the ground. So it looks sort of like this. Let me draw you a quick So you've got 120 little radial. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Looks sort of like this. this is your, here's your tower here. And you've got little wires that run on the ground. Looks like that. Every Whatever. three degrees. I'm sorry? Every three degrees. Every three degrees. That's correct. It's 120 of them. And that way, the idea is that that portion of your you have two parts of your radio wave, one that goes in the air and one that goes on the ground, and this lets it get into the ground system. And that's the reason that all radio stations, all AM radio stations are designed that way. It's required by law. Um, then the guy wires are broken up with insulators so that they don't, they're not part of the radiation thing. Now one of the things that I talked to Mr. Groth John about, and uh, rather than putting a chain link fence 
around the base of the tower, that creates a problem because that radiates again. And you got dens are right across the street, and that would create all kinds of problems for them and for the neighbors. What they need to do, and what most stations do, is put a wooden fence, a 10-foot square area of eight-foot tall wooden fence, keep the kids and people out of it. And that's a way I would, I'm sure that's probably what he'll end up doing here. You can put, decorate it up with any kind of landscaping you want, but it, and match it up to the building that he's gonna put over there. The other thing that I suggest that you do is rather than putting a complete enclosure around every guy wire, put a face fence up. Because what happens, the face fence is just one, one fourth of the, of the fence. Instead of having a building, I mean a guy anchor, where you've got a box around it, like this, just make a face, just to have one side here. The idea being to keep somebody from cutting, who's cutting a yard or whatever is going to keep from hanging themselves. And that's what most all of the broadcast stations around the country do now. The other thing I suggested was that he put a sleeve on here out to the point to where the, the guy wire is at least 10, 15 feet above the ground so that if somebody's driving a tractor, they ain't going to hang themselves. That's happened out west quite a bit. So we, it, it's going to be your damn if you do, damn if you don't, because if you put the yellow sleeve on that thing, it's going to look it's a little noticeable. But that's what you want to do to try to keep somebody from hanging themselves. Uh, we've tried using blue, and that works in a lot of places, the blue sleeving, because that way you just hit it and you don't, <laughs> you don't choke yourself. But, you, but if you put the face fence up rather than a box, what happens when you put a box around guy anchors? Uh, after about five years, it all grows up and nobody maintains the darn stuff, and it looks like crap. So we just put a face fence up, and that solves it. And everybody seems to be happy with that. Um, the, the guy wires are not copper, incidentally. They're, they're galvanized steel, so you don't have that problem. And generally what they do on the ground system, they generally, where the ground wires connect to the base of the tower, they paint them, paint them black or we paint them gray or some other color so you don't, the good old boys don't find out that it's copper down there. It's just a, just a system. It's a game we have to play, and we do it all over all the United States. It's just it's, it's a natural thing. Um, some places, it, it wouldn't work here. But in some places, you can drill a well right underneath the base of the tower and drop a ribbon down it, uh, the height of the tower. The tower is 195 feet. You can cut 195 foot in the ground and drop the ribbon down there rather than putting the radials out. But the, the ground conductivity here doesn't support that. So what, what would the ribbon do? The, it's, it's a, it's a three-inch wide copper ribbon, and it goes down and hits your water table at different levels. And that would accomplish the same thing mm -hmm. as the ribbon. But, you, but your conductivity of, of the clay soil that we have in this area won't support that. So that's why they have to put that's why they have to put the radials in. On a scale just just of, of information, trivial information, on a scale of one to ten thousand for conductivity, with the seawater being ten thousand, the ground conductivity here is one point one. <laughs> so that's why you have to put the radials out to be able to get your get your signal into the ground. Any other questions? Any other physics lessons you'd like to learn tonight? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Roger, I want to make sure I understand exactly why they came for an exception. It's because the three radial guy wires are too close to the property line? No? At, at the beginning of our, our zoning regulations, uh, they list some towers that can be exempt from our tower regulations. Uh, but anything that exceeds 75 feet has to go, has to be approved as a special exception. So what the issue tonight for us is approving the height. Yeah, just approving the tower. Keep in mind, this is a different tower. Normally we've got cell phone towers, but this is an AM broadcast tower. Now I think AM receive only towers are exempt too, but this is not a receive. This is, this is a broadcast tower. But, but that, it being over 75 feet, slides it into that category of tower that has to be approved. I hate to be dumb, but is an AM tower like a pipe? Hmm? A tower. Mm hmm Is it like, look like a pipe? It's not a pipe. It, it, it's not. It's, it's not. not. It's got three sides. It's oh. like a triangle. Okay. It's, and each side is 18 inches wide. Okay. So. All right, thank you. 
Mr. Mr. Perry, have you uh, have you consulted Denso, and do we know that there will be no problems with the transmission of this to their? No, I haven't equipment? talked to I haven't talked to Denso. I have talked to Mr. Groth, John, about uh, talking to their uh, whoever their director of IT is over there because their equipment is very sensitive to. Now they're about a little over a thousand feet away from where his tower is going to be. He's going to run a thousand watts, so. The odds of that happening are fairly slim, but it's possible. Um, I suggested to him that, you know, where it's going to happen is if he's going to get anything, it's going to get in the telephone system in there because if they have a multiple, um, and they do, any major plant is going to have multiple inputs to their telephone. And if that's going to be a problem, then you eliminate the problem at that point. And Mr. Growth John was aware of that. And I asked him to get in touch with their people before he ever turn the transmitter on or anything like that to make sure that they're aware of any kind of problems. And it's his responsibility to clear that up. I mean, that's federal. That's a federal regulation. If you cause a problem, you've got to fix it. So it's not Denzo's problem if, if he causes it. So it's up to him. Is there any way to test that ahead of time? Not easy. Uh, you could run a long wire maybe out in the field there. Uh, with a temporary crank up pole or something and try that. But the problem is getting a thousand watt transmitter out there with three phase power or whatever. It's going to be a little tough. So normally, because Denso is in a, is a totally encapsulated building, as a matter of fact, it's hard to get cell coverage from inside the building out. Uh, I doubt there's going to be a lot of problem there. Um, again, it could be, but I just don't think so. I have a question for Mr. Groth, John. Um, do you have any, even though you'd own the property, would you have any contingency plans if your license wasn't renewed in 2020 or y'all decide to close up? Uh, what would you do with the tower? Well, sir, the, the, the license, you know, we've, uh, the license has been renewed uh, every uh, eight years since 1957. I was I just think, curious. What I think, Mr. Chairman, I think the, the rules here require also, they do in all the counties around here, that any tower is not used for a period of six months has to be removed anyway. Uh, ours actually says 12 months. 12 months, yeah. 12 months. It's got to be removed anyway. Expense. At the owner's expense, that's correct. Mr. Groth, John, my, my, jacket, my biggest concern is that you put this tower up and it affects Denso somehow. And you spent all this money buying the land, putting the tower up, and now they're telling you to take this tower down, and that's going to be on you. That's a that's a, a gigantic concern of mine. Yeah. Well, the it's not a it's not a. I appreciate your your concern, and I, I thank you for for that. Uh, but the uh, it's a uh, even Radio Shack sells uh, phone line filter adapters that you. Put on a phone line to prevent such interference, and it's you know it's an engineering expense. I mean, if they have you know, they have a, you know 40 or 100 phone lines over there, which is highly unlikely. You know, in, in the uh, in the 20 18 years that we've managed WBCR, we've changed, changed transmitters uh, to a digital transmitter 10 years ago, and uh, so it's a hotter Intense signal, and uh, I had one, you know, one resident, you know, in the area uh, surrounding the tower. You know, we're located now. It was directly opposite <coughs> within a mile, you know, of uh, less than I mean, it was probably a thousand feet, you know, direct line. 
the side. As the blueberry farm up here on 321 called me and say that they had a problem. We drifted that down. So, you know, I, I appreciate your concern, but I, I feel confident that uh, you know, we'd be able to bring any concern you might have. I don't think it's likely we would have because of the amount of electronics that exist out there already. You know, a thousand watts is it's not very much electricity, but very much wavelength. Long wavelength and at as much high frequency uh, and energy that's generated over there, you know, we're just going to bounce off. In my estimation, in this area. I just want to differ with me in that regard, but I think you confirmed it. It's very unlikely that we're going to have any interference over there. Um, <clears throat> you say you now have a thousand watt? Yes, sir. What happens if you decide you want to go to 2,000? Well, you know, that'd be nice if, I, if the FCC would allow me to do that, but unfortunately, they, just, they, don't, they don't entertain those kinds of changes. That, that's a big deal. For AM radio anymore. Yes, sir. That's my question. That's a big deal, yeah. Okay. I, I'd like to think that they'd allow that. They have for 18 years that I've been in business. Thank you. I can give you a thousand percent assurance that that's not going to happen. <laughs> Just, just out of curiosity on that, if they did, would you have to increase the tower height? No. So we could remain the same. Did you say a thousand percent? Yeah. I thought that's what you said. The problem is you have other stations posted on the same frequency you have to protect. And when, when, you have, when you have other stations on the same frequency within a certain miles away, uh -huh. he can't increase in power. Okay. And they've looked at that several times for... Mr. Uh, Growth John station over the years, and he, there's no way he can increase it. Thank so you. I, I, I feel comfortable with that bed if you put some money on it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion from the board? No, Chairman, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to accept the tower. I'm under the uh, the restrictions that you have, the yellow guide wire guides, and the one side fence. I second. I second motion. That was Larry again. Yes. Okay. Just a second. A vote of yes is a vote of yes is to approve the request. Andy Allen. Yes. Larry Chesney? Yes. Stan Hedrick? Yes. Rob Walker? Yes. Motion approved. Tonight we have one variance from uh, front setback requirements on Brick Mill Commercial Drive. That's right, it's at 108 Brick Mill Commercial Drive. The property is. Uh, Locate, uh, is identified on tax map 100, parcel 8. Property is zoned RAC, which requires a 60 feet front setback from any road right of way or easement line. The applicant would like to divide a lot off of his tract, but meeting the 60 feet front setback from the proposed private road uh, that he was going to put on the plat for access will not be, uh, would not be possible due to the location of the current buildings that are existing. The proposed right-of-way will be a 50 feet and private. The request is only is only from that right-of-way and does not include any setback from the arterial road which is 411 South. The setback requirements in the RAC only mention the 60 feet front setback but if you review the commercial zone you'll notice that the setbacks range from 30, 40, and 60 feet depending on what classification of road the property fronts on, and I have in included all of that for your review. And uh, the applicant is here tonight, and he actually does have a plat showing what he's intending to do. He's wanting to cut one lot off, but he's got remaining property behind this. Since you gentlemen are the only ones left in the room, I suppose you all are for this. All right. Uh, this is the plat that was just surveyed off. 
the uh, this is 411 South. This is the private drive here, and the setback only concerns off of the private drive. Which, in speaking with the planning department, it was kind of a surprise that the 60 foot. Everybody knew it applied to the 411 South section. It was a surprise that it applied to the private drive. And in the commercial section, the 30 foot is acceptable. But in the RAC, currently it says 60 foot off of all setbacks. So we're requesting 30 foot on the private drive only. Okay, I have a question. <clears throat> These are the existing buildings there now. That's correct. And there's a couple of buildings over here that are empty. That's correct also. And, and you're asking for an exemption for these existing buildings or for this lot? For this lot. So, and we're, my, my concern is that you're asking us to approve a setback for something that we don't know what's going there. The, the buildings are already there. They're, this one is occupied and the purchasing people will occupy this one back here. So are we approving a gravel area? No, I'm sorry. Is this is a paved road from? that was built to uh, right. state specifications right. that in the future when it's decided that we've done anything we're going to do, then it is built to the specs that we can turn it over to the county for county maintenance. Okay. Bill Dunlap assisted in designing it, the Harrison Construction built it. The only place that's gravel is the parking lot for both of these two buildings. And the setback actually measures, we have a 25 foot from the center of the road on both sides, which totals 50 foot on both sides of the road. The measurement from the center of the road coming back 25 foot for the right of way and then applying the 30 foot uh, because this, this building back here the question is, I, I, I'm not clear if, why you're asking for an exemption for something that is existing. Well, uh, the, the reason for that is this, that lot does not exist. He's wanting to create that lot. This, this lot one doesn't exist? It doesn't all exist the now. Acres there. It's, it's um, all one parcel got, right the now. The other buildings belong to me as well. Okay. I, I just want to cut this one lot off. I've sold it yet. Mm. Uh, so, okay. okay. I'm sorry. I, as I said, I'm not hearing real well. well so when I, I drove down there, I looked at all that and I said, I'm not sure what, what the problem is. I, I didn't understand the problem. I, I just want to sell this lot and keep the rest of the time being. You're selling Basically that lot? Basically, so he can get the plat approved. To sell. To sell, yes. So he's selling the two buildings and the gravel lots, lot one. Yes. And we have to give him approval for those exceptions on the setbacks for him to be able to get this the way he could sell it. Correct. Um, the the setbacks, are they from the center of the road or are they they're, from? They're from the property line. Oh, okay. Which the property line's not there now, but that's that's where it would be. Right, so yeah. you would have a 30 foot setback yeah. off Which, the proposed property line. It'll actually be 25 foot from the center of the road and then 30 foot additional for the set got 55 feet to from the center of the road to the middle. Yes. And it meets all of those specifications. So, let me make sure I understand. The distance now from the edge of the road to the building is 30 feet. Negative. The edge of the, the existence property. is the 30 foot. This line right here is the property line which measures 25 foot from the center of the road. And then there's an additional 30 foot from the property line over to the corner of this building. 30 foot nine inches to be exact. And and the and the requirements for this type of lot, that 30 feet should be what? 30 feet. Oh, 60. as the RAC regulations read, 60 feet. So we're giving a 30 foot variance. Yes. That, that, is that the issue? Yes. He's asking for a 30 foot variance. How wide is this road total? It's a minimum of 22 feet of asphalt, uh -huh. and then it'll have the right of way for drainage and utilities on both sides of the asphalt. Okay, so your property line is about 12 feet off the asphalt. Yes. 13 maybe. So RAC requirements and 
the other requirements aren't in sync then, right? Exact. So all this would do is get this REC requirement in sync with what's already acceptable commercial. and commercial, yes. which is the way it should be anyway. How do you get permits to build a building to start with? When you built this building, the 30, 60 feet, what? The, the property line there. wasn't there when he built the buildings. No one really knew the 60 feet applied to the private drive until this comes. Because his property line was there. Yeah, he's got the whole this ball. Just, this is just a driveway. This ain't even a road right now. No, it's it's paid. Yeah. But it's paved. Yeah, but it's just yeah. a driveway. Yeah. It doesn't, it, by the way, it doesn't show up on your GPS. <laughs> <laughs> if you try to find that place on GPS, it, you just it, drive around in circles. It, was, huh? it doesn't work. You call Rogers, hey, Roger, how do you how'd get to this place? So they gave me an address on 411. It just pops right up. Well, the, the, the buyer of the property, he went way up 411 <laughs> north before, and then he finally had to call somebody. <laughs> 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 He's up there at Dollywood yeah. Dollywood. <laughs> His GPS was made from North Korea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any other discussion on this? I'll oh, fairly entertain a motion. I'll move. I'll second, second it. A, a yes vote is to approve the request. Andy Allen? Yes. Larry Chesney? Yes. Stan Hedrick? Yes. Rob Walker? Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. That's all I've got. No other business tonight. No other business. Is there a motion to adjourn? Sir.